Good morning, viewers and listeners out there. Here's another chapter in the British Business Podcast series. Today, we're from the iconic Headland Hotel here in beautiful Cornwall. And we have the most amazing Varian Palmer, who is the director of this family-owned business. Welcome. Thank you very much. And you should be saying welcome to me, because this (laughs) is your building. (laughs) Welcome to the Headland. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And it's so beautiful. And we came yesterday and stayed in one of the cottages. Mm -hmm. Stunning. I mean, stunning. So this morning is all about you and trying to understand the business that is the model and how you fit into that model and your journey and actually the family's journey Mm because you were telling me earlier about your parents. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to start and tell us the background as to how you came to own this beautiful building? Yes, of course. So my... I'm a fifth generation hotelier in Cornwall Um, and my parents had had another hotel in Newquay when the headland came up for sale. My mother was 21 and my father was 26. They'd been married for three years and they heard on the grapevine that the headland was available Um, and so they sold everything they had, absolutely everything, to purchase this iconically beautiful building um it was in a very poor state of repair um i think if it was raining you'd be lucky definitely on the third floor you would have gotten a little wet um i think even on the second floor um and then for the last 43 years they have poured all of their profits their love their attention everything into turning this hotel, which on the eve of them opening for the first summer season, an AA hotel inspector witheringly told them, you barely scrape two stars, um, into the beautiful five-star hotel, cottages, aqua club, spa, um, that we are today. Um, I grew up with the hotel. Um, I had my first job here when I was 13. Um, with Kathy, who is um, still working with us as a waitress wow. um, in the terrace. And she trained me very, very well. Um, and I've worked sort of on and off through my school, university uh, holidays. And uh, I rejoined the family business back in November 2020, so nearly two years ago now, with my husband. Um, and we're both directors sitting on the board with my parents as other, the other two directors. So you gave the ages when your parents first bought the hotel Mm -hmm. how long ago was that um 43 years ago 43 years ago and yes as they reflect and we talk about it quite a bit how hospitality and hotel life has changed so much back in those days my mother was in charge of reservations and had a huge book where she would pencil in when people had written to her to book their week and then once they'd paid their deposit um, or paid for their stay she'd then go over it with with an ink pen to confirm the booking um, whereas now it's all on computers and it, wow. it's a very different setup now. Wow. <laughs> Those types of stories are, are iconic, aren't they? The, the memories that they will have about doing that and today, actually, some of that gets lost, doesn't it? Because those are pretty special things to have done in those times and those memories are amazing. So your journey and how you started, what sort of areas in the business did you do to get your stars and your stripes to get to this position today? Well, as I said, I'd I'd been working through my... um, I'll start from the beginning. I think I was about 10 um, when I... I think I told my parents in the front hall here that I wanted to go into hotels. Um, At 10? Yeah. I'd... um, (laughs) From a young age... So when I was young, you couldn't go as a child into the main restaurant until you were about six or seven and could dress smartly for dinner. Um, And I used to love coming with my parents and seeing them chatting to guests um, and really just the whole hubbub and the buzz of being in the hotel. So age about 10, I declared I wanted to go into hotels. Um, And then age 13, started work here as a waitress. I then did, I did children's entertainments for a bit, um, dressed as a purple dinosaur. (laughs) Don't ask any more questions about that. Um, I've I've worked in housekeeping. I've worked in the kitchens. I've worked. I've done some KP shifts. I've done wine waiting shifts. I, I was the pudding girl for a whole summer. I just served desserts off the dessert buffet. It was wonderful. How much clotted cream can one can you put on someone's plate before they go? Oh, maybe that's a bit too much. Um, 
Then, yes, I, I worked in reservations. I've worked in sales here. Uh, a real mixed bag. Um, I, I went to university to study business management. And then after that, I worked in France for a little bit um, before going to work at the Goring Hotel in London. Oh, wow. um, so probably the, the most iconic family-owned hotel in yes. the country um, where I learned a huge amount of how a five-star hotel operates. At the time here, we were still only... I think we were full star down here at the, at the time. And then I worked um, at Cliveden House, um, which is the National Trust owned five star property owned by Iconic Hotels or run by Iconic Hotels um, before working at the University of Oxford and at Christ Hospital School for Compass Group. And I was in contract catering. Again, same, same, no different looking after people. I mean, yes. that's what hospitality is. We're just looking after people just different people <laughs> on those different occasions um, before returning here. So a lot of different things. A journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how long have you been in position here? So um, I was on maternity leave with my second daughter. Um, I started in, so in April 2020, just as the pandemic was kicking off, I was five months into maternity leave. I started an MBA, um, a level seven apprenticeship um, MBA. I was with Compass Group at the time, but everyone was in lockdown, everything. My parents, I was having conversations with my parents in that lock, first lockdown where they didn't know the computer systems. Our managing director here had stepped away from the hotel, left in February, and they were effectively so aged. literally weeks se before. They the were 71 and 60, do my maths, 65, 64. And I was trying to coach them in how to use the computer systems using a, a sort of combination of FaceTime, Zoom, Teams, <laughs> um, and then helping the hotel to get reopen um, after that first lockdown um, and just trying to support the family business. Um, we had no idea what was going to happen. We didn't know if we were about, at one point we, might, we, were, we had put all staff on notice of redundancy because we had no idea if we were going yeah. to survive this. Yeah. Um, and then after some conversations, um, decided that, yes, actually raising two young girls and my husband down in Cornwall would be the best possible thing. I think Hips, his, he was the one who came up with the suggestion first. Where were you living at the time? Um, we were living up in Marlow. Um, oh, okay. So, yes, up in sort Good. of, yeah, up country, very much up country, north <laughs> of the border. Um, and so, yes, we moved back in, yes, November 2020 straight into another lockdown. <laughs> wow. I mean, you baptism, baptism of fire, isn't it? I mean, you've gone straight in from there with no, no real experience in this hotel. Of course, you knew it. Uh, I'd been general manager here okay. um, when I was 25. Okay, so you um, had a little So bit. I'd had some experience. Okay. Um, and I'd, yes, I, I knew the hotel and I still knew a lot of the staff. Did that but, help? Yes, because when... When you've got so some of the staff here have been have been working here for forty three years. Wow. Um, Kathy, who trained me, age thirteen, is still a waitress here. So when you know people, and even I think, yeah. and it's really important, I think, when you're at a senior level in an organisation, having those key individuals through the the organisation, even at an entry level positions, who you can go and talk to them and say, "Am I being silly about this?" And they can quite because they've known you for decades. <laughs> yes. They can quite honestly say no, no, that's all right. Or no, that's not a very good decision. It really isn't. Um, and I, I very much like to surround myself with people who are very happy to tell me when I'm being an idiot. That's trust, isn't it? You're yeah. trusting them. They're yeah, trusting I trust them. you. I trust them. Um, yeah. And I think I'm also very aware that with a lot of my experience that I've had, I've worked in operations. And I mean, an operations manager, operations director, for in a hospitality business you're the jack of all trades yes. master of none yes. and so i have to rely on certain individual key individuals within an organization who are absolute masters at their area and what they do i'm never going to have their knowledge of, of everything um so i need to just they need to tell me what they're doing and that's a key skill really because i remember general ford uh, i say i remember I, i've listened to some statements and read lots of anecdotes from general ford about always being surrounded by wonderful special intelligent people and he would always say that he was probably one of the thickest people in his circles and he, i remember a, a journalist 
asking him lots of questions about the business. And all he would do would dial the the particular extension. Can you just come into my office? And they would know everything to do with finance or HR mm -hmm. or logistics. So, yeah, it's important, isn't it? It's very yeah. important to have those people around you. So the building, the, the operation, looks like it's had a new area to it to, mm -hmm. to be added, the, the spa. Was there a spa before you did the new spa, the Aqua Spa? So back in... I've got to get my dates, dates in order now in my, in my head. Um, back in the late, so we, we opened the cottages. The first phase of the cottages opened in 2000. I did my work experience my, when I was 16, unpacking dishwashers in the cottages. Wow. I still reckon I'm one of the fastest dishwasher unpackers you've ever met. I'm very good at that, <laughs> even now. Um, and after the cottages were finished, um, and they were designed by a local Cornish architect, um, we'd approached the family, or my parents at the time, because I was only 16, 17, had approached him to say, we think we need to build a spa. There was a, a lot of uh, country house hotels and hotels um, outside London building spas at this point. Um, and he was quite, he was very clever, and we're very thankful to him eternally now. He said, instead of doing a spa building by itself, Think about the longer term strategy. Um, and I think his his conversation with, with the family about you've got to think longer term. Um, he said, do an entire site wide plan. So instead of having a planning battle every two to three years when you want to then do the next project and then do one whole site redevelopment. And so oh. we did a massive sort of, I hate the phrase, but blue sky thinking. Yeah, sure. What would we want to develop? How could we... Um, as a family, we very much believe that we are looking after this beautiful building for just our generation and for future generations to come. And so very much everything we do here is about how can we make this building right and more sustainable for its future. And so with that, we said, yes, the spa. We need to build the spa. That was project one. Um, we have the we had the old outdoor swimming pool, um, which was in not the greatest location. Um, it's a bit windswept. And we had an idea. My father had the idea of moving it to a, the location where the Aqua Club is now. So that was another. We had to sort out our goods inwards. Um, so that's where we so that was project. That's one, two, three, phase four um, of a nine phase redevelopment plan. Wow. And we did one big planning permission for the whole site. So after the Aqua Club is... We've also then got um, an underground car park to try and remove most of the cars from the top surface so that the hotel will look more like it did in 1900 when it was built okay. and there were no cars, really. And then after that, um, there's planning permission for a 300-person conference centre in the cliff top beside us on the beach. Um, we're not sure whether that's quite the direction we want to go in, but that planning permission was granted with not a single objection. Wow. Um, we spent... A, a lot of time my parents spent a lot of time with the architect meeting people um anyone who came up here to have a look at the plans had a look at them um and explained what we're doing is trying to put the headland right for the future and so with that uh, the planning mission was granted and we built the spa so that was finished in took a while to build was finished in 2012 a um, bit, bit more works. And then the Aqua Club, which is the, the new build that opened in July 2020. Don't open a beautiful swimming facility in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> Not the greatest move. Um, but that took um, that took a long time, it took two and a half years to build. So six swimming pools, a restaurant. It was, um, it was, a, it was a challenging build. Um, and now we're just turning our sights onto the next phases. Um, once we get through the the challenge of the energy price increase, um, and yes, things like that. We're, we're, as a family, we reinvest the profits back into the hotel. That's Excellent. what we do. Okay. Wow, what a, what a journey that, that was. And so you mentioned the energy crisis, and I know that there's been an announcement this morning mm -hmm. by Liz Truss about capping. Um, we've just been talking about it. And one of the things I'd like to drill a little bit further down to because we're hugely driven by understanding mm. and making sure mm. about team engagement, team retention, mm -hmm. team recruitment. Mm -hmm. So actually coming to work to an organization, you have to put those building blocks in first mm -hmm. 
to recruit people, to attract them. Then you've got to make sure that when you get them, you train them well, <laughs> you engage with them so that they'll stay. Yeah. Because it's a big investment, isn't it? It's a big investment of time, effort and money to be able to get people in the first place and then keep them. Mm. What sort of journey have you had over the last five years or, or, or let's even say since Brexit? Because I know a lot of people have struggled with the recruitment, engagement and retention of staff. Could, could you yeah. expand on that? I think I'll, I'll go to set the scene. I'll go back a little bit further. Okay. Um, when Investors and People sort of first launched, um, my mother was very interested in the people and culture and training and development of the team at the Headland. And the Headland was one of the first companies in the Southwest to get Investors and People and then to get Investors and People Platinum Award. And we've all we've had for decades a very strong um, i hate the word people plan but people plan to because we're very aware that for a lot of youngsters um we've always employed a lot of young people here um we could potentially offer them a amazing career an amazing job and for those who want to travel the world leave cornwall an amazing route out and hopefully they'll come back again. Okay. And a lot of them do. Um, and so I think through the decades, that is a very well-established um, sort of strategy that we have and that people recognise us for. Then came the pandemic, Brexit. We had a lot of European sure. staff before sure. that. And how many staff have you got? And, 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 and does that fluctuate? 243 just under the 250 mark <laughs> thank goodness um and it does fluctuate um we do over the summer months we have a lot of university students uh, who come and work for six or eight weeks i mean Newquay is the ultimate party town live hard party hard <laughs> they definitely do that definitely burning the candle at both ends <laughs> um but everyone has a lot of fun um we don't really we don't advertise for seasonal positions we tend to have a very flexible working approach um we have a lot of staff out of choice who choose to have zero hour contracts because they're chasing the waves okay or they're ch they they're yeah. here to have fun as well as to yeah. work and as long as you earn enough money to pay the to pay the, the bar tab <laughs> at the end of the night <laughs> i think it's some of their mentalities um so yes our staff does fl fluctuate um a little um but we normally are around the 200 to 240 to mark generally okay. we have definitely seen a decrease in European staff. Okay. Um, which for us, is, what was particularly challenging for us was a lot of the young Euro staff, the, the European staff that came over were young. And if you've never worked in the UK before, you can't get settled status. No. So where we would normally have a, a, a significant number of Spanish, Italian, French, German, young staff, um, Eastern European young staff would come over for a year 18 months to practice their English, um, to have a great fun time. Yep. Um, they can't get the settled status now. So there's a whole tranche of young people who effectively can't, can't, can't come and work here, which is, I do think is a little unfair for young people. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, though, we have really focused our attentions on young people in Cornwall. And in September 2021, we launched the Headlands 14 to 16 year old young person placement scheme, where for six weeks of the year, um, over the summer holidays, young people get to come and be paid £8.81 an hour um, to uh, come and learn about hospitality and have a fantastic time. Um, and on that note, for anyone who's watching, 14 to 15 year olds um, don't have a minimum wage. And if anyone wants to campaign to their local MP, they should. I think that that's, it's deeply unfair. And there is a real sense of child exploitation that goes on. And I speak at a lot of schools. I speak at a school or a college or university about once a week about this. And the number of young people who are being taken advantage of is, is terrible. Um, it, it's wow. really... And it's, it's under 16-year-olds. Um, and... So that's another, I'll get off my soapbox no, no, no. now. I'll get off my soapbox. These are really important um, issues. And I think that, so, so we have these, we have um, these young people who come to join us who are bright eyed, bushy tailed and the easiest people in the world to train because they're so excited. They've got a proper job and they get a pay packet 
and they're getting a great pay packet at the end of the, at the end of the month. Um, and we tend to retain them. So this year we had 10 this summer. I think, I think we might even be all 10 are still working with us now in September. Okay. Um, and which is an amazing retention rate in an industry that doesn't historically retain staff that well. Sure. Yeah. So we look after them. So, so do you, so that's a great area to, to focus on because we know managing and measuring gets jobs done. Mm-hmm. Do you, and have you always m- measured retention rates always. at your business? You've always met, you've always. Yeah. Okay. And because the Oxford University research that we've looked into mm-hmm tells us what the costs are Mm -hmm. of recruitment, what the costs are of loss of productivity, what the costs are of a lot of loss of turnover. Those are three important areas because they're so vast Mm -hmm. when you lose, especially the head of a department Mm -hmm. somewhere in that area. But it doesn't matter if you lose a person, you've got that cost and you've got that time and you've got that energy that's all disappeared Mm -hmm. out of the business. And if they go to somewhere else and if it's a competitor... It's even worse because all of that knowledge then is a drain. So I think we might be slightly different in how we view this. Um, I think we're very fortunate. We're one of the larger single site um, hospitality businesses in Cornwall. Um, When we've got young people who've been with us for maybe a couple of years, we've had a lot of training with us. We actively help them to find jobs up country in other five-star hotels, wow. generally independently owned if we can, because Cornish people tend to come back. And we have our, our current operations manager, interim operations manager, was started as a porter with us, worked his way up to being a duty manager, then went to New Zealand, did 18 months in New Zealand working, 18 months I think, and then came back as our reception manager and is now just is now our interim operations manager. So long-term thinking, long-term because strategy. We're here, we're here for the long. We're, we're here for the long term. I know that some of the young people who've we've helped them to find jobs elsewhere are. We won't see them return for another ten years. Okay. But we're happy to play that game. Okay. Because it's a long game. It's a long game for us. It's not. It's, it's like employing the fourteen-year-olds. Yes, in the, that first summer, they're brilliant but they do need a lot of support a lot of training a lot of confidence giving life skills to be tra- taught to them but for us we've worked out that so we've got one young person um, who's fantastic she's she's going to go and become a doctor I mean she will she has viewed this as this is how she's learning people skills so when she's a doctor she can be the best doctor she can be and be able to talk to people that's why she's t- took the summer placement job but she's also said that from now until she becomes a doctor, she's going to keep coming back here. That's why we do it. That's so for a, for a stat, for a normal three year university sort of uh, university place. Um, it's about seven years of, of, of school holidays, university holidays that we will have someone. What an insight! That's unique. I think we've yeah. m- we've interviewed a number of um, hospitality type businesses, and and that long-term thinking and i know that you're here and i know that cornwall is a very different place to most places because those people are going to come back why wouldn't you want to come back here (laughs) it's beautiful yeah but what a what a great strategy but vision that's about vision isn't it yes i think i think we're we're very lucky because because we don't have big external investors we don't have people screaming for their dividend payments um we can take a a much longer term strategic view on recruitment retention than a lot of we're lucky than a lot of other businesses who have to hit their year-end results have to hit their staffing ratios we know that the 14 year olds means that we have we our staffing ratios are much higher than Mm -hmm. they probably would be if we had 10 well sort of i don't know mid-20s staff but this is about also helping Cornish people to find really meaningful, well-paid, brilliant jobs and careers for the future. It's like that old adage, isn't it? If you love something, set it free. Yes, You're setting exactly. it free oh, wait, I for think, them to come I think, back. I think some of them would say it's not so much as setting free, kicking them out the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because... no, we, we act, I mean, so this, this January, we are doing the £2.2 million refurbishment of our main restaurant and the kitchen. Um, and 
I think we're now nearly most of the key staff are going off to do week or two week long stages at other places around the country. We're paying for their transport, we're paying for their hotel accommodation, we're paying their wages so that they can go and experience somewhere else. I have no doubt some of them, of the six or eight that are doing it, some will have their heads turned and will want to go. But that's fine because at least we've opened their eyes to what else there is out there and they might come back to us in the future as a head of department, as a senior manager. If ever there was a saying, if you love something, set it free. Boot it out the door. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great Can you tell me about the triple bottom line strategy? Yeah. Um, over the decades, we've actually had quite a focus in this, in this area. But since my husband and I have sort of joined the board as directors, we've really tried to focus our, strate- our, our aims, our visions, where we're going. And with lots of conversations with my parents, we came to the realisation that over the decades, our focus on people has been our absolutely overriding decision-making thought process. Um, so when we, we strongly believe that if we look after our people, and that is our team of staff and our guests that we then also look at the planet. So when we are reviewing that, we're not talking about not just the eco sort of sustainability, not the, I'm going to use the greenwashing that yes. can go on, yes. um, but also the local community, yep. um, which touches back on what I was saying earlier about the young yep. people. Um, if you look after your local community, you are helping to look up, create a sustainable business. Um, actually, our profits will look after themselves. Um, which is very strange for, for general managers who join the business and for other people who senior leaders when they come into our business and so oh, what profit have we made this month? And as a family, we are also more interested in our employee heartbeat score, yep. our guest heartbeat score, yep. and also what have we done in the local community this month? So we work very closely with um, a number of uh, initiatives, so Cornwall Community Foundation, to help um, redistribute um, some of the income that comes from our guests into the local communities into specific projects. We also work with the, the local distribution and sharing centre, Nuki Disc, um, where we provide all of their fresh, um, fresh fruit they have every week. Um, and Nuki Food Bank, we do the Christmas food parcels for Nuki Food Bank. We don't really talk about it. In fact, this is practically the first time I'm talking. Really? We, we don't do it for PR. Yeah. Um, we do it because we think we have a very strong belief as a family that a business, and particularly one of the largest single site employers in Newquay, is so, should be so embedded and intertwined yeah. with the local community that if we can help support, um, offer meaningful jobs, we're, we're a real living wage payer, um, offer... Um, proper employee benefits so staff can swim for free go to the gym for free come and dine for free bring their friends and family a 50 percent discount there's a lot of things we do to try and help not just the immediate person who is earning the wage but their families and people around them Um, and we try and support where we can in newquay um without fanfare so yeah this is a bit weird talking about it now but i think there are there is more possibly that businesses can do and it's just as simple as picking up the phone to your local secondary school and saying hi i'm in x I, i'm in x industry um what can i come do a careers talk yep. um schools are crying out for that sort of thing yep. um and i think things like that that we we have especially those um if you are an, a sort of a leader of your organization or a leader in the industry in an industry you have you should have a moral duty to yep. give a little bit of your time. And it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be lots and lots and lots of money. It's not money. Generally, we find that it's the local charities want trustees. They want people who can help with their finances or their marketing or their social media pages. So giving we give our staff time to volunteer, paid time to volunteer. Um, and it just helps the local community because we all have to rise together. There's no point us just rising by ourselves. We've got to help the whole local community rise at the same time. That there isn't one business owner controller that I've met where I've asked the question about giving, 
And when they turn around and say, that's probably one of the best bits of what I do, mm. is the giving. Because the feeling of giving is just incredible. And it, it doesn't surprise me again that somebody of, of your stature is, is sat here saying, you know, this is about giving. And mm. you don't look, you don't give to receive. No. You give so that people will grow and people will benefit. Yeah. What will happen eventually is that if you do it well enough, it, it will automatically come back in droves. And <laughs> we understand that mantra. We are massively into that. So, wow. <laughs> Another fascinating interview for the British Business Podcast today, this stunning, iconic Headland Hotel. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for talking to us about you. your journey and the business. Until next time, 